Today we're going to be looking at the internet, ethernet and Wi-Fi in a simplified as much as I can way. We're going to look at what kind of connections you can use to bring the internet into your home, what's available or coming in the future. We're also going to be looking at how you can extend the range from your router to different devices in your home. Hi everyone, I'm Scott. I am the host for Close From GTE and I, am, I wanted to do this video because we're doing a budget build at the moment, but the internet is a really important part of that. And the whole point is that we've got to get to a gaming, streaming and content creating. We want to see what we can stream and that's pretty much what we're going to do in the next video. I've found is that when you have a router in the home, it's not all the time next to where your computers are and you either need to extend it by using wi-fi or ethernet and i thought well the best thing to do is look at the different types of internet that you can have and then once the internet's in the home what's the fastest way of getting it to your computers when i started this video i was 90 percent done and i just realized there's so much information that it wasn't worth throwing that much at you and it was better to simplify it down. When you're watching the video and by the end you think, that was okay, I really enjoyed that, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications as well, and give us a like. That way you help us to build the channel and I can bring these out a little bit faster each time to you. So let's dive into the first section, which is the internet and see what's available in the world today. In the past, the fastest way to link up to the internet was by dialing up through your phone line. Now in 1993, we started with a 14.4 kilobyte per second, which is really slow. It ended with 56 kilobytes per second in 1998, which is why most people know of a 56K modem. This was the speed which you could transfer the data, it was 201.6 megabytes per hour. Uh, in March 2000, DSL arrived, which is a digital subscriber line, and it gave a dedicated internet connection. Still using the same methods, this was changed and improved over the years, produce a final download speed of about 300 megabits per second. 2010 advances in fiber, cabling bought about both cable broadband and fiber broadband. Now, they're very similar and they're not at the same time. So cable broadband uses what's called coaxial cables, which is a, a very specialized cable to link the house to a fiber hub, which could be, they, they call it the final mile, but normally it's down your street or somewhere near to you, which then transfers the data to and from the home. Whereas fiber broadband was a fiber connection to the hub and then a fiber connection from the hub to the home, which makes it a lot faster. The fastest connection available in the UK today is provided by Virgin Media. However, the surprising feature is they use the coaxial cable method. The term HFC or hybrid fiber coaxial. The advantages in technology means they can now produce up to one gigabit per second speeds and Virgin Media currently offers a 1130 megabit per second speed package using this method. So, so why is it still a faster option than what fiber broadband customers are mainly receiving? This is because all of them use the same method of connection. They all use fiber to a hub. You have different ways of then connecting from that hub to the home and the with fiber broadband the connection to what's called FTTN which is fiber to the node and then you've got to the curb which is a little bit nearer to the house and that's FTTC. You then have building wise where the fiber goes into the basement of a building and then is distributed through other means and that's called FTTB which is business or basement or building and then you've got the fiber to the home which is the fastest connection which is either FTTH which is home or FTTP which is premises they're both exactly the same pretty much uh, it is this time costly to install you have to pay individually of the premises or home all these methods have varying distance and that is why there is such a difference in regards to how fast they can get their speeds currently the next connection to arrive was wireless 5g which as it states uses a signal rather than cabling to provide you with a link to the internet. Like fiber, it can provide up to one gigabyte per second speed. Wireless at this time is restricted 
connected to a 100 pretty much megabit per second upload speed. The other thing to consider with a signal is the same thing as we're going to see when it comes to Wi-Fi. A signal, it has to go through walls, it has to go through objects, and that can actually disrupt connection to the home. The upload speed is restricted to accommodate fast download speeds from all providers. Therefore, your upload speed will always be at a smaller ratio to your download. Satellite uplinks came next, and the main in-news example at the moment is Starlink. This has a 300 megabit per second download and is designed to reach areas which are a little bit more rural and less telecommunication infrastructure areas compared to other types. This can be given the current conflict in Eastern Europe where a lot of telecommunication infrastructure has been damaged or destroyed. Therefore, Starlink has been provided to help keep communications going where they're desperately needed. The last on the list is broadband over power lines. Now, this is one which they've experimented with recently, but it doesn't look like it's going to gain much traction. Apart from the fact that it's really low download and upload speed of three megabits per second, it was a design which again was to get to rural areas where you actually did the internet down a power line. The biggest problem with power lines is that they're not designed to be noise resistant so there will be a lot of noise and static in the line. Every time you turn a device on or off you get like a pop or a click and that could disrupt the actual internet signal. We now need to see how we can extend the range past the router and we're going to look at Wi-Fi and Ethernet. For video conferencing, the upload download speed need as low as 1.5 megabits per second for a one-to-one -one on Skype and it can be as high as 4 for a 10-person Google Meet video. Netflix and Disney both give this recommended streaming of 4K video at around 25 megabits per second. Streaming Twitch has a low-end requirement of 3 megabits per second and high end of 6 megabits per second. This will probably be based on an upload of 720p versus 4K, with most streamers openly opting for the low end to give a more stable experience. Wi-Fi started around 1999. We'll jump to Wi-Fi 4, which is 802.11n, which is a connection speed of 600 megabits per second. That seems an okay speed when looking at internet speeds available. However, this speed also compromised by a few factors, and it's mainly down to how many devices are connected. When you're moving around your home, you'll notice an area where the Wi-Fi seems slow or cuts out, and this is because frequencies being used have a real issue with getting through objects. 2.4 and 5 are the current frequencies that you can use. 2.4 gigahertz frequency is long range but slower than the 5 gigahertz frequency, which is short range faster connection, has low ability to pass through solid objects. By combining two frequencies, the Wi-Fi hub can connect to devices using the best means of speed and stability for further distance possible. As we move over to the next one, which is Wi-Fi 5, uh, it's given the designation AC. There was an improvement up to 1.3 gigabits per second across all connected devices. And then when we get to Wi-Fi 6 or AX, the connected ability goes from 10 to 12 gigabits per second. The next one is in the future, which is BE due to be released between 2024 and 2025, giving a combined data rate of up to 40 gigabits per second. It is to note that Wi-Fi BE or Wi-Fi 7 is going to be tri-band and it's going to include a 6 gigahertz frequency, which again will be a much reduced range compared to the other two, but faster speeds. So to start this part of the video off, we're going to take a look at different ways that you can connect a computer to a network. When you take two, three, four computers, actually it could be any number of computers, but in a localized environment, it's called a LAN network, which is local area network. As you go a little bit bigger and your these LAN work networks are being connected together from different areas like a unicampus or a city, it becomes known as a MAN network, which is a metropolitan area network. And then if you go further from this, the next similar network is called a WAN or wide area network. This is connecting multiple LAN sites over several cities of the world and in business you connect your sites using the network provided and getting lease lines together by tunneling the information through the internet. The internet itself is actually described as a WAN network. But we want to only look at connected computers in the home and feed the internet to them. So let's look at a LAN setup for the home. 
Ethernet is going to be defined by various hardware and cabling you use to move the data. Also by doing this, we're going to remove devices from the Wi-Fi, allowing there to be less conjecture in the Wi-Fi. Um, overall for shared devices, it should make life better. When looking at the cabling, you'll need a main cable from the router to the what we're going to use, which is a switch box, which allows you to then connect all the devices in a smaller area. With CAT cabling, it's CAT, which is short for category. We are currently kind of in CAT5, CAT6 territory. CAT5 being the one which was used when LAN set, setups first started. With the CAT cabling, loads of info. So let's uh, simplify this as well and look at the most recent standards. CAT5 is probably the most used cable when LAN networks were becoming standard in offices. However, the speed was 0.1 gigabits per second until the release of CAT5e, which allowed speeds of up to one gigabit per second. This was followed by the CAT6, which was the same speed for the distance. However, up to 37 meters would allow speeds of 10 gigabits per second. 6a followed, which gave 10 gigabits per second over the 100 meter distance. 7 and 7a were not endorsed, although they are available, they're not really used commercially as 7a would allow 40 gigabit up to 50 meters, which was a quite a significant improvement. The last one on this is CAT8, which actually gives up to 40 gigabits per second, but only up to 30 meters. The cabling type is also thick and not easy to bend. So it's mainly designed for servers and mass information hubs. As we're just building small home ethernet, this kind of cabling would be overkill. I have measured the distance required to get from the hub to the computer and it came to around 13.5 meters. Now we need to future proof this a little and so I went with a 15 meter flat CAT 6A cable which cost £10.62. To connect this cable to computers we'll need a switch box and so I went with a TP-Link 8 port, a gigabit desktop switch which allows a one gigabit transfers between each port. That was 21.44. Cables to from the switch to the computers and consoles in the network. As they're all around the same desk, we bought 10 CAT6 two meters cables, which cost 17 pounds 80. The last item I bought for the LAN was a separate ultra slim CAT 6A two meter cable, should we need to do temporary connections on the desk for testing, and that was five pounds 99. For local area networks, I spent a combined total of 55.85, which at the time of the filming, is around 67.54 in US dollars or 63.34 euros. If I quickly go to the monthly budget for anyone who's following the project, I'll add 200 pounds in for this month, which although this video is coming out in January is actually for October. And we're gonna remove the cost of the land items, giving us a balance at the end of 215 pounds 38 pence. The Wi-Fi adapter which we used as part of the first month and so we don't need to deduct it again. Now with everything installed and working let's get on with speed testing. I had to test the two ways but unlike a lab we'll also do this with all the extra devices still connected. It will give a more realistic result of day-to-day -day speeds than a lab environment which will give a maximum potential of both. I have the LAN installed and the best way to do this is to do a speed test. We'll use PC2 mainly because PC2 has USB 3 on it. It also has uh, the main gaming, it's the main gaming PC at the moment. PC1 will be a streaming PC at the moment whilst we're doing the upgrades. We will test Wi-Fi and Ethernet 20 times and then gain an average for each one. And let's take a look at the results. Looking at the graph, there's one clear winner for downloads and that's the Ethernet running between 300 and 400 megabits per second, with the Wi-Fi having some really poor results. If we look at the averages for the upload speed, averages for both were a lot closer, between 40 and around 52 gigabits per second. Although you can't really see it there, here, there is latency, which is really important in gaming. And as we bring up the averages on those two, it, it gave results steering towards Ethernet around 3.6 compared to a really poor Wi-Fi latency of six milliseconds. For gaming, anything more than 10 to 15 milliseconds on latency is really going to be pivotal in your gaming. You're going to notice things like rubber banding it can potentially get you kicked out of a game if, if it does start happening a lot. Therefore, installing an Ethernet into your workstation with gaming and streaming is a worthy investment, as long as you make sure you get the right equipment for what you're dealing with. Wi-Fi will continue to improve and it's mobility powerhouse. It still gives you the freedom for your mobile devices, but Ethernet will, at least for the near future, give the stability and speed as well as the lower latency 
at further distances. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button if you like this video. Uh, leave a comment if there's anything you think that we should do a video on and who knows, maybe we'll do an entire video dedicated to what you suggest. I am Scott, thanks for watching, see you again next time.